Okay, we are live. So, okay. Welcome everyone to the webinar. Hello, good morning, good evening, depending on the part of the world where you're staying now uh, and where you're watching us. So, uh, I'm very, very happy um, to see there's like a few viewers at the moment, but we hope the, the number will increase. Um, so, my name is Tomas Pomerani, I am the SCOPI director, and we are having today a webinar as part of the Exchanges Week on global health in exchanges, since today is also the Global Health Day, and we are focusing on how to implement global health in the exchange program of IFMSA. With me, I have Jessica Evert from uh, Child Family Health International, and also a member of CUGH, who works essentially on global health competencies within the uh, Global Health Education Committee of CUGH. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica, of course. Um, and then Iris Blom from the Netherlands, who is currently in China, who is my general assistant, and uh, her work is also focused on global health within exchanges. So again, thank you very much to the speakers for joining the webinar. So I will start now with my presentation on global health in exchanges. So I will share the screen. Okay. I hope it's visible. Okay. Um, so let's just start with uh, the with webinar. Uh, I already introduced the speakers. So um, there they are. And we're going to talk about global health during the webinar. Um, but I would like to start with the main question that uh, this webinar is focused on. And the question is, do you think FMC exchanges will make us better physicians? Um, uh, I would say the answer, you will discover the answer during the webinar. Uh, but of course, I mean, we, we, we believe that uh, they actually make us better physicians. Uh, so we're going to explain you the reason uh, throughout the webinar. And first of all, I would like to start with a definition of health and global health for you to be introduced to the topic. And therefore, I will start with the definition of health um, as defined by WHO in, the, in 1948 which is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So this was one of the first time uh, where actually the health was seen as something that went beyond the biomedical concept. Um, so uh, something that included also the mental dimension and the social dimension. Uh, actually, one of the first times that this uh, kind of social dimension was uh, considered within health was at the beginning of the 1900s uh, with Rudolf Virchow, who was also the father of pathology. But that was probably one of the first times when it was formalized in the definition. So let's just talk about global health now. Um, there are many definitions uh, of global health. There is no universal definition of global health as a concept, but um, one of the most commonly used uh, is the one that you can see on the screen, uh, which is taken by, from an article that uh, was published on The Lancet in 2009. And global, it says that global health is an area for study, research and practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. What can be understood from this definition is that it essentially, um, it's essentially a field that transcends political and geographical borders class, ethnicity, culture. Um, so it's really interdisciplinary as a field. And also it requires collaboration between the different sectors, inter interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, in order to stay to reach a state of health equity and interdependence. Um, there is also a very interesting table that I would like to show, always from the same article um, by Kaplan et al published on The Lancet, which essentially highlights the differences between global health, international health, and public health. So uh, global health is about health issues that transcend national boundaries, as I was saying. Um, in terms of cooperation, of course, it's focused on a global cooperation. So it's um, it really is connected to problems that are uh, essentially global problems, and then affect everyone in every country. 
It's also focused on prevention and clinical care. And in terms of access, Global Health is focused on achieving health equity among nations. Um, and it's highly interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. The difference between global health is, and international health is that international health is maybe binational. So it focuses on issues outside one's own country. It's always focused on prevention and clinical care, but it's more like uh, projects um, and sort of cooperation also um, to help a specific nation. So to help another nation, for example, uh, there can be a project between two countries. Um, and embraces a few disciplines. Then public health is more focused on the national level uh, or focused on specific problems that are related to specific communities within a, within a context. Um, it's more focused on prevention and um, it's multidisciplinary again, like global health, and it's still focused on health equity, but within a nation or a community. So these are the main differences between the three fields. Uh, which I hope are now clear for you. Um, we have some examples of global health challenges uh, that we thought about, uh, just for you to understand a little bit more about the concept. Uh, as I was saying, it, we are talking about issues that transcend national boundaries and are really global issues that affect everyone. Um, so it can be something about um, climate change, which is a very, very uh, important topic today, and it's affecting every country. Um, and it's having effects on health of the populations in every country. Um, we also have non-communicable diseases. We can talk about, um, of course, health migration. We can talk about um, antimicrobial resistance um, and so on. So there are many uh, global health issues that are very, very important today. And they are also important and tackled in the global health agenda at the present time. So, as a next point, I would like to explain a couple of concepts, starting from the concept of health equity and then social determinants of health, because health equity is essentially mentioned directly in the definition of global health. Um, so I would like to elaborate on this concept. Equity, uh, as a definition, is the absence of avoidable, unfair, or remediable differences among groups of people. Um, so this is the definition of equity. And in terms of health equity, so equity connected to health, uh, this concept essentially implies that everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential. Um, so no one should be disadvantaged from achieving the potential um, or having the full health, essentially. I think that it would be good to just explain a couple of difference. I mean, the main difference between uh, the concept of equality versus equity, because probably you, you heard about equity and equality. Um, so in general, I would like to, I mean, this is the most common example that is used to explain the difference between equality and equity. So imagine that you have three boys or yeah, three men, as in this case, trying to peer over a fence to see a baseball match. This baseball match. Um, if you just give each one of them one box, one single box, you're providing them with the same service, as, let's say, um, and the same opportunity in a certain sense. But that doesn't mean that we actually uh, are all going to be able to see uh, the baseball match because you're not considering their different hates in this case. So if you want to give, um, uh, this is, is an, an equal treatment, that means equality. But if you want to give an equitable treatment, which means equity, you have to provide them with as many boxes, essentially, as uh, they need, um, considering they hate. And this is the concept of equity. So, moving on to the social determinant of health. Um, I would like to um, say that for improving health and achieving equity for all, um, we believe that it's important to understand the factors that affect health. So these factors are called determinants of health. And this is why we're talking about the social determinants of health now. The definition of social determinants of health is that there are conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. So it's essentially uh, everything that affects health from a social perspective. So um, yeah, the condition of the economic con uh, condition, 
the working environment, the education, the housing. Um, they are all listed in a um, sort of nice graphic that was developed by uh, Whitehead and Dahlgren in the 90s, uh, which I'm showing now. Um, so as you can see, this is a graphic of the determinants of health. And they will start from the center, um, mentioning the, the individual factors, age, sex, and the hereditary factors that cannot be um, modified by anything. Uh, then we have the individual lifestyle factors, then the social and community networks. And then we have a series of social factors, and these are the social determinants of health, going from living and working conditions to unemployment, water and sewage, social health services, housing, working environment, education, agricultural and food production. And then we have um, a general, general socioeconomic and cultural and environmental conditions. Every, the more you go to the outer la layers, um, and essentially that the outer layers influence all the inner ones. So the social ones are the ones that influence the individual choices, individual lifestyles. And what we say is that the, uh, the more you go to the center, the more you can find the proximate causes of diseases. But then if you go to the outer layers, you will find the causes of the causes. So these are the social determinants of health, essentially. Let's provide with another example uh, of proximate causes. For example, you can say that uh, lung cancer uh, is um, caused by smoking, um, and then coronary heart disease it might be caused by obesity and unhealthy diet which are part of individual lifestyles. And uh, the malaria may be caused by a prick of mosquitoes, in fact, the, by the plasmodium of uh, malaria. Uh, but there might be something behind these proximate causes um, because scientific literature shows that diseases affect poor and marginalized people the most, and people from a lower socioeconomic status are more likely to be affected by diseases and have higher mortality rates. So in general, they have poorer health outcomes. Um, so the, I, I want to show you a, a sort of small table from the Atchison report that was uh, shared in 1998. Um, it was conducted in the UK, in England. This study divided people into different social classes according to their occupation. So uh, professional, managerial and technical, skilled, no manual, skilled, manual, partly skilled and unskilled. Um, so according to their job, essentially, they divided the people in different categories and they gathered data about their mortality rates in the period from 1970, 1972, then 1979, 1983, 1991, 1993, as you can see on the table and on, that, that is shown on the screen. What we understand from the example is that the rates are always higher in the lower classes. Um, the numbers have decreased almost always from the first period nine, in the 70s to the last one in the 1990s. But the gap, so the difference between the higher and the poorer classes has increased. Therefore, even though people in the 90s uh, were essentially healthier than people in the 70s, inequalities in health are increasing. Um, so that's what this, show, this study showed. Um, so maybe some people are affected by coronary heart disease because they follow an unhealthy diet and are obese, but Perhaps they might do it because they don't have money and time to buy and cook healthy food. This is an example of the causes of the causes. Um, so these are the ultimate causes, poverty, marginalization, and so on. And um, as I was saying, um, general improvement in, in health, decline in mortality do not affect class, classes equally as uh, scientific literature has shown. As mortality rates fall, social inequalities commonly widen. This was said by Michael Marmot. Um, the bottom line of all of this um, and my introduction to global health and social determinants of health is that health is complex and it's not only a result of individual choices, but health inequities are avoidable. So we can act, we can do something to uh, eliminate inequities in health. Uh, diseases affect mostly poor and marginalized people, as I was saying about the Atchison reports, but many other studies have shown the same thing. Social justice is at the core of health equity, and then we can improve health of everyone by acting on these causes of the causes, the social determinants of health. Uh, and also it's very, very important to have health in all policies approach, because we're talking about global health, which is a very interdisciplinary field. So we need to think about health in every kind of policy, from justice, economy, and so on. 
So this is it from my side. Now I'm going to give the word to Dr. Jessica Everett, um, who will talk about why is Google Health important for future healthcare professionals and also a scientific background on the competencies that students should develop during the medical placement abroad. So I can share the screen. Share Jessica's screen. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. It's great to be here. Um, so I'm Jessica Everett, and I am a family physician. I'm at UCSF and Child Family Health International. I'm actually um, the former vice president of the IFMSA USA um, national organization before it merged with AMSA, the American Medical Student Association. So. Um, I've been to a couple of GAs, and it's a really a privilege to be working with IFMSA again, and I'm a huge fan, so congrats on all you're doing, and um, I do what I can to really emphasize the strength of the IFMSA exchanges. So as um, we heard about the definition of global health, which uh, was codified in the Lancet in 2009 as a field of study, research, and practice that placed the priority of achieving equity and health for all people. Um, there's been alternative definitions put forth, one at the same meeting where the Lancet definition was um, founded, and that was that global health is a concept fabricated by developed countries to explain what is regular practice in developing nations. This definition was put forth by a Kenyan physician, and obviously it didn't make the lancet, but the spirit of it and the fact that there are concerns that global health is being fabricated, uh, particularly by developed or more powerful or resource-rich countries, um, to explain the realities of resource poor settings is really important to hear and understand and think about how we uh, engender authenticity in our learning and our experiences in global health. And then of course we have more indigenous explanations of health such as afya kwa kama mungamba which is health grow like a banana tree in, an, in Swahili. I say this because it's important to also remember there in our local explanatory models and um, healthcare practices that are also important to consider. And as um, the Scopy exchanges really consider how they are embracing global health, we're gonna talk about what that means. Since I was Vice President of IFMSA USA, I have gone on to complete my residency and specialty training and as well as become Executive Director of Child Family Health International which is a San Francisco-based nonprofit that provides global health learning opportunities in um, 11 countries. And we have participants from 40 different countries in those programs. Um, certainly, I wouldn't want to attract anyone away from Scopy, but I do want to mention my positionality and kind of what I do in a day-to-day -day sense um, so you can get an idea of where I'm coming from. We're going to rely a lot on this graphic as we talk about what it means to train and learn and um, embrace global health. So this is a depiction out of Canada, and I really like it because it starts to capture the multifaceted aspects of what it means to become a global health expert or to get educated in global health. Um, in the center there, you see it says global health expert, but then you notice on the white petals around the center, there are roles such as communicator, collaborator, manager, health advocate, scholar, and professional. Global health and developing expertise in global health really requires us to go outside of our, cert, of our usual training environments and our usual focus during our training experiences, which is why when you are embracing global health on a SCOPY program, you really want to think about broadening our usual content and our usual thinking and focus. In order to gain these skills of communicator, collaborator, manager, health advocate, scholar, and professional, there are a variety of different ways we can, we can nurture our learning and practice, and that includes formal curriculum, mentorship, transformative evaluation, and practice. Global health, importantly, all of these activities in this learning happens within the context of values and principles, such as health equity, social justice, solidarity, reciprocity, responsiveness and accountability, respect, honesty and openness, humility and sustainability. And these values and principles 
are often antithetical to what we usually are embodying when we're doing a clinical or research training experience. So global health requires us to embrace a spirit that is different than our usual spirit when we're doing clinical or research electives or rotations. It also requires us to embrace content that is different than what we're usually doing. So as you think about your exchanges and how you want to integrate global health into them, thinking about how to nurture these values and principles structurally as well as intangibly is really important. So um, Tomas talked about the social model of health and I, and I have a similar graphic. I also want to point out that the interventions in whether they be public health, clinical, um, sanitation, economical, etc., those all also have a social model and are embedded in complex layers of a society and an individual's life, living and working conditions, as well as socioeconomic, cultural, and other conditions. So in order to be the best physicians we can be and to understand our patients' realities and to understand the realities of communities that we work with or that we empower, um, understanding this very complex web of factors is so important. Here is an example. So um, many of you may know what the net is that um, you're seeing in both of these pictures. This is a malaria bed net. Um, when they are impregnated with insecticide and used to cover beds, they are one of the best prevention mechanisms for malaria. However, if you're trying to get people to use bed nets and they are having different priorities, such as food security or the explanation of why they're important doesn't come across or culturally it's not acceptable or for a variety of different reasons, then the intervention that you're intending on having falls flat and doesn't have the impacts that you hope. So that's why deep understanding of context and um, also assessment and evaluation of what actually happens when we try to do interventions is so important. In addition, we are called in global health and really in healthcare more broadly to look beyond hospitals and clinics. This is a study in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was the first to capture what percentage of a person's health um, is determined by what happens in, in hospitals and clinics versus factors outside of that. And surprising to many of us who are pursuing medicine, only 10% of a person's health is determined by what happens in hospitals and clinics. Things like social circumstances, behavioral patterns, environmental exposure, and genetics are as strong or stronger determinants of health. So this calls to us to get out of hospitals and clinics and look at the context of our patients' lives. So let's think a little bit about what are some key ethical tenets of practicing and learning about global health, and why is global health unique with regard to ethics and practice? Well. Unfortunately, global health has sometimes become a neocolonial endeavor where you have people from richer or um, often more industrialized countries such as the US, Canada, the global north, Europe, going to poor, what they see as poor settings and doing things that are experimental or outside of their scope of expertise and thinking that they are impacting health. This is an example of an Instagram post. A student says, Suturing up a head laceration on one of the Vietnamese locals, hashtag volunteer surgeon, hashtag I don't know what I'm doing. And I hope you know, but I will just reinforce that this is not global health. In fact, this isn't even health care. So we really have to be careful when we're going to poorer settings that we don't act outside of our scope of expertise or without a mindfulness of the ethical and patient safety issues. The Onion, which is a spoof press uh, based, I believe, in the UK, um, has spoofed this. This is in 2014 with this headline. New Doctors Without Licenses program provides incompetent medical care to refugees. And you can see in the picture there's a doctor with a blood pressure cuff on someone's head. So this is a joke, but it's actually based on reality. And so it's so important that we recognize that providing incompetent care to poor people is not global health. And in fact, it is not within our appropriate domain as physicians. So unfortunately, global health has been co-opted by a lot of organizations, entities, and students, faculty, others who are actually putting patients at risk because they're trying 
to do good, and they have very good intentions. This is um, a paper that we wrote that captures some of the harms to patients, which include death of an infant, patients not diagnosed with malaria, um, children put through spinal taps and delaying diagnoses by an inexperienced student trying it, students writing prescriptions for inappropriate doses, pulling on breech babies, sticking infants an unnecessary number of times, and dispensing medications at pop-up clinics. So we really, um, there's a call within global health and within medical education more broadly to ensure that we are having high ethical and patient safety standards when we're working in settings outside of our usual setting. There's a lot of reasons why these things happen, but I'll just point out a few. There are power imbalances in healthcare as well as in relationships between traditionally more resource and less source resourced areas of the world. There's a rise in chronic diseases and even the requirement of longitudinal care in um, infectious diseases that is not always appreciated. There's a high risk environment for medical errors. We have highly motivated students, people like you and me who really wanna help, but often are going about it in ways that is not constructive. And then we have easily ignored health systems. So the bottom left is a photo of community health workers who if you weren't oriented to who they are, you would drive right by them not knowing that they are integral to the primary healthcare system. And so oftentimes you'll find organizations or individuals who are telling people from the global north that nothing is happening in X, Y, or Z poor setting. And what happens is people are ignoring existing health systems. This is where the Scopy exchanges are so strong because you are working in existing health systems and you are working with local medical students, your colleagues that are around the world. So you have an advantage because you are already being put into settings that are longitudinal and are actually part of the formal health system, rather than fly-by-night parachute-in volunteerism. So let's go back to our um, image for a moment, thinking about how do we get this training and what training are we trying to get? This is um, a seminal article that I had the opportunity to co-author, and it was looking at what are the competencies, what skills, knowledge, and attitudes um, are we trying to engender when we are trying to be global health-oriented health professionals. In addition, what are levels of proficiency? So this article was the first to define levels of proficiency in global health. Before, it was like you either did global health or didn't do global health. There was a complete lack of nuanced understanding that this is a stepping stone professional process that has different layers of expertise. This paper went on to define domains of global health competency, and many of these go outside of our usual clinical training environments or scope of, of, of focus. So things like global burden of disease, globalization of health and healthcare, social environmental determinants of health, capacity strengthening, which means developing local capacity to address health conditions in a longitudinal way, collaboration, partnering, and communication. This is a huge strength of IFMSA and an opportunity for you guys to capture what you're doing so well with the GAs and your year-round collaboration amongst so many nations and so many different students. Ethics, the professional practice, health equity and social justice, as we talked about earlier. Program management. So management of programs and teams is something that we don't often get taught in medical school and so education that we need to seek out. Sociocultural and political awareness and strategic analysis. This paper went on to break down these different domains into specific competencies and then to define those competencies for the global citizen level, which is the introductory level, as well as the basic operational program level. It's an open source publication that you can get if you just Google um, the title, which I'll show here, Identifying Interprofessional Global Health Competencies for 21st Century Health Professionals. I'll also give you my email. You can email me if you wanna get a copy. Other important data points for thinking about what it means to embrace and learn about global health include this data, which comes out of USAID, which is our kind of um, development organization that's governmental based. And this was a study of employers in global health and asking what are weaknesses that health professionals who have only worked domestically in their country of origin have when they're trying to move into a global or international space. 
So these weaknesses are, are areas for our, us to target competency development during the Scopey exchanges if we're trying to build on our global health expertise. These include understanding context and realities of global health, developing our personal skills such as flexibility, adaptability, and creativity, having cultural sensitivity, cross-cultural communication, and knowledge of key players, systems, and processes. This is another important paper. So that first paper I showed you was a synthesis of over 24 competency sets. The issue I really had with it is that many of those competency sets come out of the global north and they are dominated by voices from the US, Canada, Europe. And so to me, that is not an authentic understanding of what we need to learn about. So this paper brought together researchers from eight countries and really um, gave us an opportunity to research this together in a um, multi-national um, manner. And so what we looked at was what are communities where we're going so where you might go on Scopey, what are those community members, um, your mentors there, your fellow students, what are they thinking we should learn when we come from a different environment? So let's take, for example, let's say you're going from Italy to Zimbabwe. What do the Zimbabwean community members and professionals want you to learn? The respondents for this study were from over 25 countries, a really nice cross-section of regions and geographies. The types of students that they were hosting were not just medical students, but also um, what we call pre-medical, which is medical students, um, the first year, few years of medical school in many places, as well as nursing, nursing public health students, business, engineering, uh, PhD, social sciences, and others. So what were the results of this study? So we asked, what's important for students to learn and do in your community when they're coming from an outside community? This includes students recognizing our own limitations. So this is different often than what we're thinking about when we're doing a clinical elective. Oftentimes, we're doing a clinical elective, we're thinking that it's an opportunity to expand and not admit limitations, but try and do things that we haven't done before or hands-on clinical activities that we don't normally do. This work would suggest that we really need to recognize our limitations and not necessarily take advantage of these environments to expand our clinical skills that are not yet completely honed. Need to work well within a team setting and maintain respect. So how do we understand teams? How do we demonstrate respect in a culturally appropriate way? And how do we work well over time with those teams? As well as needing for us to understand the huge role of culture in health and healthcare. And that clinical learning was much less important than learning about culture and professionalism. So again, this challenges our usual assumptions about Scopey exchanges, that they are about clinical learning. No, perhaps they are about learning about context, learning about professionalism, learning about collaboration and humility. Importantly, 0% of respondents said that students should come able to independently work with little or no supervision. This is very important because, as I mentioned, many students that go from the global north to the global south have a over-emphasized or over-expanded um, understanding of what they have capacity to do, meaning that students will go from, from richer to poorer settings often and do things that they are not allowed to do at home or they don't have expertise in. So this study is really reinforcing that host community members are not seeing us come as independent or sole practitioners and that we need to embrace our own limitations, humility, and focus on contextual learning. In addition, with regard to the number of students, um, the majority of, of respondents were happy with the number of students they were hosting. Um, half but wanted more students, half said the current number was fine, 0% wanted less, which emphasizes that having visiting students is something that is desirable. 72% of preceptors received feedback from students and 71% engaged in debriefing. So again, thinking about how the Scopey exchanges are structured, what kind of feedback and debriefing is happening. The qualitative data from this study is still being analyzed, but some of the quotes I wanted to emphasize, these were biggest mistakes that were made. They, meaning you, me, all of us that are visiting a different setting, must abstain from over-expectation, over-criticism, must have a compassionate approach as the host and the team puts lots of effort in establishing the program. 
It's a problem when we don't respect the environment and culture and come out of our comfort zone, do not want to follow discipline and dress codes. It's a problem when we tend to overexpect from the programs as we as they, meaning us students, want hands-on experience which cannot be provided very extensively, keeping with local government administrative protocols in place, and attempting to do too much and not being able to achieve goals. And another qualitative data point was what we should remember when we go home. Folks said our culture and our dedication to make their time memorable, the knowledge they gained here and the hospitality. During the program, some of them discover their potential and they should always believe in that potential. To be a good doctor, you need to be a good listener, must listen very well to your patients, and that they can change the life of a person who's different if they are aware and respectful of that difference. So there are guidelines with regard to how global health learning experiences happen. I'm just pointing out a few here. One is the weight guidelines, another the AAMC guidelines, and the form and education abroad. The World Medical Association also has recently um, passed guidelines as of last year that um, IFMSA alumni actually led through the World Medical Association. Those are very similar to the weight guidelines, but I can send that uh, link out to you if you'd like. There's also workshops. These are open access, free workshops for preparing you to do a global health experience. And this is an oath to be a global ambassador for patient safety, really indicating that we are shifting our perspective and what we should be doing in country and thinking about patient safety as primary. And then when we re return to these values and principles and the ethics of this, there's some resources and guidance there too. These reinforce some of the messages we heard before. These include humility, solidarity, social justice, and introspection. This article um, by Ra Andrew Pinto and Ross Upshur um, is really helpful. It has case studies and um, it's a great resource. In addition, we have resources such as development theory. So Child Family Health International uses an asset-based community development theory called ABCD. And that calls on us to delegate power and control to local community members rather than the traditionally more powerful visitor. And when we think about what are the actual impacts of us going to other settings, this is a really important question. Because having sustainable health impacts during a scopy exchange or during um, a global health experience is actually not borne out in the literature. So we had an independent Stanford researcher look at what are the impacts of having students go into different communities. And some of these impacts were improved English proficiency because English is a language of communication between the students and the hosts in our programs. Increased prestige of host institutions. So when host institutions are hosting us from other settings, there is prestige that comes along with that. As well as fulfilling local practitioners' sense of global citizenship. And I'll share a quote about that. Increasing the ability of local individuals organizations to build and leverage networks and the movement of and access to resources such as financial, project, bandwidth, and supplies. Some of the negative consequences of the host community include perceived hesitancy and apathy of trainees, unfulfilled promises made by students who are visiting, and lack of equal opportunity. This lack of equal opportunity is less of an issue with Scopy because you have the exchange model which is so important and so unique. This is a quote by one of our Indian medical directors, and it really emphasizes that this is not all about the student coming to visit and to help. It's really about the connectivity that um, we allow for local communities. So this quote is, as a global citizen of the world, if I'm able to educate a student from any other nation and he feels a little softer about places that are not as economically well off, then from that perspective, of course, it is beneficial because we are benefiting some students living in affluent nations to have a balanced view of life. So if we don't have health benefits with Scopy exchanges or other learning experiences in global health, then what are some of the benefits we can have? Well, these include students extending bandwidth unrelated to hands-on clinical care, so working um, with projects, with administration. Also, thinking about stepping stones, so building our expertise over time to have a cumulative impact on global health over our career, not just within a two, four, or six-week period. We can work with assisting with data collection, chart review, quality improvement, and capacity building, and link it, linkage to funds or resources from outside that community. So I um, thank you for your time. I wanted to provide my personal email. If you want this slide set or you want any of the articles or ask me any questions, please email me at jeverett at cfhi.org. And thank you again.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jessica, for your very interesting presentation. So I will now give the word to Luis so that we can move on with uh, essentially the part on why is Google Health important for us, uh, IFMSA, as IFMSA, and also for IFMSA exchanges, and then how to implement Global Health into our exchange program. Yes, can you see my screen? And hear me now? Yes. All right. Um, hey guys, so excited that you're watching this. Um, Jessica, thank you very much for providing a lot of insight on this topic. I think it's very crucial. This information can be very useful to, I think, all of us um, working within Scopy and Scurry. So I'm going to be touching more on the uh, sort of concrete part of this. So I'm going to um, make a link between what we've heard about global health, what we've learned about uh, uh, going on certain certain uh, health activities in, in other countries, and I'm going to connect it specifically to our exchanges. So um, I'm going to start <coughs> off with saying why it is important. I think you guys have now learned about um, uh, global health, and you see the importance of this also in connection with uh, the activities that we're uh, we're organizing. So I think it might be quite obvious, but just to stress it again. Um, it is important because exchanges give us the opportunity to improve our knowledge on global health and the social determinants of health, which is a part of that. Um, so they provide the students, students that we organize the exchanges for. And they also improve cultural sensitivity, communication skills. So in the end, why is it important? It's exactly the reason that we are organizing our exchanges. Um, <clears throat> because it turns future medical professionals into better physicians. Um, in the future. And then I want to show you the global health learning objectives that we make use of within Scope and Scurry. So <clears throat> I'm going to read them out and comment on them. So the first one is to know the primary health concerns and basic epidemiology of the host country and how it differs from the home country. I think it's a, a very important part of our exchange because medical students are going from a setting that they're familiar in to a completely different setting, that they'll, they'll, they're able to compare both of these settings with each other. And of course, we all know that different countries face different issues. So getting exposed to these issues and learning about the epidemiology of the country really gives you both insight in the country where you are active in at that time, but also insight on your own country since you're able to compare which it's probably not possible before. Um, secondly, the second global health learning objective is to understand the structure of the healthcare system in the host country and how it is funded. Um, this also comes back to being able to compare because um, as we know, there are many, many different health systems in the world. Some are privately funded, some are publicly funded, some are partly privately, partly publicly funded. Um, and it's very important where the funding comes from. It's very important how the healthcare system is structured in what the outcomes of the system are. So if you're really active in it, and <clears throat> as an exchange student, you're active in another healthcare system, you will receive an understanding of the system. And which again will not only provide you insight in the healthcare system right then right there but also in your own healthcare system because you see how do things are being um, done differently in a different setting in a different country the third global health learning objective says to have a knowledge of the medical education system in the host country um, you might, th those of you that have been active in IFMSA for some time and that have spent time in international meetings or have uh, talked to other medical students over the whole world have probably realized that there's many different medical education systems in the world. And this is therefore also an opportunity for the exchange students to connect with medical students from the country over there or even uh, from other countries, um, but especially with medical students from there and learn about how their medical education system works. And then the fourth point is to observe professional and doctor-patient relationships in the host country and compare them to the home country. Um, <clears throat> it was mentioned by Jessica also is that there's different ways of behaving in different countries, different ways of dressing, different ways of addressing a patient, 
or addressing a, a professor, addressing a doctor. There are many different <coughs> cultural aspects when it comes to um, relationships and how to how to go about this. So it can really teach you a lot um, on on these different uh, different ways to go about uh, relationships. And then the fifth one is um, to identify any differences in public health regionally and nationally in the host country. Um, so what this means is that you, um, as an exchange student, by experiencing your your uh, exchange in an in in your host country, you will be able. The objective is that you'll be able to identify also differences in public health of your region um, of the nation. Um, and therefore also get insight in the country that you are having your experience in. So all in all, these are the objectives that we aim to achieve uh, when it comes to global health and our exchanges. So it's important to keep those in mind when implementing global health in your exchanges so that you know what we're doing this for. So I'm going on to the next part. Um, <clears throat> this is what has been done um, when it comes to global health and exchanges. Um, on the international level. Um, so different things have been conducted by SCOBY, SCORI, and in general, and I will explain them one by one. Um, and this is an overview very quickly. So we have a global health training, global health within exchanges guidebook. And then we have this webinar, which I'm not gonna explain, but quickly right now, um, this webinar will be available on YouTube and it gives us a lot of insight. I personally can say that I learned a lot from Jessica's contribution as well. So I think this can be a resource for years to come. Um, and then for Scopy specifically, we have the adoption of the global health strategy, where we have a new theme, global health theme, every three exchange seasons. Uh, currently, um, is social determinants of health and health equity. And we're, uh, and then for SCORI, the last part <coughs> is the global action project, which I'm going to explain as well. So the global health training, I started with a small working group quite some months ago, um, back last year, um, with a lot of motivated people to work on a specific training that can be implemented all over the world on global health. And this training is meant to give, uh, this tra training is meant to be given to exchange students. We are currently in the test phase, so our training is gonna, gonna be um, uh, tested in the upcoming months, and then we'll see the outcomes and hopefully present um, the outcomes during the August meeting. That's our plan. Um, it's a very exciting uh, thing that's happening um, because our, our aim is to provide a training that can be used by all of you uh, for your exchange students to provide insight on global health and introduce them to the topics such that we can really implement global health that way. Um, and this training is meant to be given, for example, during a pre-departure training or during up and arrival training or as educational activity, um, if that better suits uh, your context. <clears throat> and then the second thing is a global health with an exchange guidebook. And this can be found in all types of folders. So there's a list, the Neo, Nori, Leo, and Lori folder and student folder um, provide this guidebook. And this guidebook really provides you with all background information um, regarding, re regarding global health and exchanges. So if you need any background information, if you need any inspiration, in-depth info, but also good overviews of our objectives, what we want to reach with implementing global health and exchanges, please take a look. I would say actually just take a look regardless because this really gives you insight and um, resources on how to go about implementing global health in your exchanges. Um, then I'll go on. So the next one, uh, I said it was for Scopy specifically, um, is the global health strategy. So we have a new theme every three seasons, should be. Um, for, so from 2016 to 19, the theme, as I mentioned before, was social determinants of health and health equity. What this means is that we focus on this um, in our work surrounding global health and exchanges. And right now we're working on um, setting our next theme um, because of course 2019 is next year. So we uh, are gonna revise and uh, establish a new theme of, of, for which you will hear more later on. Um, but this is part of our global health strategy. 
And then the last thing I want to mention is um, the Global Action Project. Um, this is for SCORI specifically. And this is a very interesting project. It's a research project, of course, because it's SCORI. Um, and the project is, is the projects are aimed to increase knowledge and raise awareness of dif different public health systems around the world. How the project takes place is that there are certain countries within the world that organize Global Action, uh, Global Action Project, or GAP in short. And <clears throat> this is uh, divided in three stages, which you can see at the end of this slide. So you have a training part, field work part, and a research part. And this is surrounding an endemic disease that is that is um, part of the um, country that they are uh, doing their exchange or their project in. So what this means is that the student actually gets an immersive experience in this endemic disease. So a really understanding during the duration of the project of the disease, and not only an understanding, but also work experience, both field work and research experience in this area. So really in depth, um, research experience on a global health issue or, or aka an endemic disease in that country. Um, the main goal is to encourage future health professionals to learn the necessary skills for the prevention, detection, and treatment of endemic diseases worldwide, um, which you can see states in the second point. Um, so students will study and research, like I said, an endemic disease that is affecting public health at a local or national level. Um, if you want to learn more about Global Action Project specifically, make sure to contact um, your SCORI regional assistant or your NORI if you are uh, not a NORI. <laughs> um, then I will go on and talk about what we actually expect um, from our exchange students, and this is very specifically targeted, um, very specifically in the context of Scopi and Scori, but I really want to mention that um, I think what Jessica mentioned in her slides are very important points that we should all take into consideration as well when we talk about expectations of our exchange students, especially the research that she showed us um, about what the hosting countries um, expect, I think is very telling and very important for us to take into account um, when we welcome students um, in our countries. What are the doctors expecting? What is the point of this exchange? It's always something to keep into your mind, in, in, your, in the back of your mind um, <clears throat> when you're thinking about this. So what we um, expect from our exchange students uh, more specifically is the following. Uh, before the exchange, of course, learn more about global health, the healthcare system that they're going to, the social determinants, that are affecting health um, and also ex understand that about your own country. Um, because obviously <clears throat> in many countries, global health is not a set part of um, medical education. So it is important for them to also even understand their own country. Otherwise it will be useless um, comparing between countries because you have nothing to compare to. Um, <clears throat> then. And the second one could be to prepare a presentation in the upon arrival training. I think this is a great opportunity, um, <clears throat> which many of you might already um, be conducting, which is that you actually ask your, your incoming students during the upon arrival training to present how their healthcare system and how and it looks like and what social determinants are actually affecting health in their country. Um, why this is such a great opportunity is that it actually brings a group of students from all over the world together who can then present their systems to each other. So this is an opportunity for the students to learn more than just their own system and the system that they're in, but even get other perspectives as well. And then during the exchange, um, what we expect from the students is obviously to observe as much as possible. Um, this has as a goal to understand what social determinants actually play a health, uh, play, play as a role in um, in the country, and also what inequities are important when it comes to the health in the country. Um, observation is a really strong tool, as many of you probably know, um, to understand more of the country that they're going to. Um, and the second one, meet different people who work in health careers or, or even meet patients and discuss capacities needed to achieve health equity nationally. 
it's an opportunity for to talk to people that are experts in the field um, and actually understand from them. I'm talking about experts, both patients and doctors that are experts in different ways um, and understand from them what is needed, what is missing um, and how the system works. So this is a very great opportunity. Also during the exchange, um, it's an opportunity to meet other exchange students from different countries and exchange information together about local health system problems and how their countries are trying to tackle these issues. This comes back to the presentations that I mentioned early, earlier on healthcare systems from exchange students. And um, obviously talking to each other and talking about issues, et cetera, really can provide a lot of insights because so many co countries take different approaches when it comes to issues, uh, health issues that learning from each other can actually provide insights for um, each student. Also an important one is learn the rights, duties, capabilities, and limits that physicians and medical students in the country have. <clears throat> this really um, makes you understand more of the position that you have yourself in your country, but also makes you understand a lot more about the context that you're working in. So it's important to understand in what context these physicians and medical students are actually working um, <clears throat> in order to understand more of, of what you're doing yourself as well. And lastly, um, during the exchange, a student has the possibility to join different public health conferences and activities, such as medical and health screening campaigns. In many, many countries, um, there's a lot of activities being um, held surrounding the topic of health, as you all must know. And these are great opportunities for a student to be a part of as well, because this might be something that they learn about and even might bring home to their own country if they think it's useful. Um, then I will go to after the exchange. After the exchange, what we expect from the exchange students is that they fill out the evaluation form and, for example, write a report on their exchange. Um, as you uh, might be aware, we have on our database, we have an automatic evaluation form that the students can fill out from the 21st day of their exchange. And some NMOs also provide their own evaluation um, and require the student to write a report or do a post-selective debrief, for example. Um, why this is important is that evaluations teach us not only about what we can improve, but also um, what our exchanges mean to the students. So what are what is actually the impact of our exchange is something that we want to look into um, when evaluating. And of course, the first thing that I mentioned, it's also very important for us to keep improving our exchanges to keep going after that goal that we're trying to, to achieve, um, which is improving global health. And last, the last point that's mentioned on this slide is for the exchange students to actually be leaders. So it says, after going back home, students can think more critically about how to apply global health to their everyday practice and promote health in all its aspects. And what this means is that students have been given many, many insights in their exchange, which has have been mentioned before, which they can apply to their own situation back home and their understanding of global health, global health issues, different healthcare systems, et cetera, is something that they can apply on their own practice um, when they are back in their home country. Um, now I will talk about the most concrete part, which is how to actually implement global health in your own exchanges. There are um, three different um, straightforward ways in which this is possible. So you can do it during your pre-departure training uh, or pre-exchange training for SCORI. Um, you can do it for your up on arrival training. Uh, and of course, you can organize educational activities on the subject. Um, like I mentioned before, we are working on global health training. Uh, so in the future, that is something that can be used in any of these. Um, but I also want to share some examples of NMOs that are already working on, um, on implementing global health in their exchanges. These are just some examples that I took. There are uh, a lot more. So for example, the Netherlands, um, <clears throat> where I come from myself, uh, provides both in their pre-departure training um, multiple times and also in their up and arrival training, a section on global health. Um, in this, this is a training, um, so they, um, introduce the concept of global health, and they also uh, organize activities surrounding global health. 
um, and make the students think on the topic. Um, also, of course, don't be shy to contact um, other NMOs to, to gain insights from them on how they're working on it. Ethiopia has a very interesting way in which they implement global health is that they actually invite different actors that are, um, that are active in the field of global health to parts of their social program. So it actually provides an opportunity for exchange students to mix, to connect, to network with um, those who are active in the field of global health in the country and thereby um, get insights on the topic. Um, Sudan organizes um, <clears throat> weekly field trips to different parts of the healthcare system, um, different um, institutions that from different levels of the healthcare system in order for the student to really um, understand more of the healthcare system as a whole. Um, because if you're in one hospital, you might not get the whole picture. Uh, and finally, another example that I have is Bolivia. And Bolivia actually organizes a course for their exchange students. And in this course, um, the healthcare system of Bolivia is explained by experts. Um, so this is, these are some examples um, that might provide you with inspiration on what to do in your own country. And um, more examples can actually be found right now on the Exchanges Week Facebook page. Um, where there is some uh, posters that have been posted today on some other countries that have other um, ways of implementing global health in their exchange system. So check that out too. Um, so when it comes to implementing global health in, um, in, in your exchanges, there are many resources that you can use for this. First of all, I've mentioned other standing committees. And this is very important because IFMZ is, of course, as we know, not only Scopian SCORI, but many other standing committees that can actually provide expertise in many different global health related areas. One can think of SCOF, but also all the other standing committees that are active in IFMZ. So make sure to contact um, other standing committees to help you in this area because they do have their own expertise. Um, one example is that for the training on global health that I am working on with my small working group, it's not only Scopy and Scory that's working on it, but also SCOF. Um, besides that, you can um, ask the help of external parties. Um, right now in our, in our webinar, we have uh, a great external speaking, but also in many countries, there are different governmental organizations or non-governmental organizations or other parties that are active in the field of health that can provide insight on global health in the country. Um, and like I said before, don't hesitate to contact other animals that are experienced in the field because they can help you out um, here as well. Uh, if you want to contact anyone from the IT, which I would highly um, advise as well, because we can connect you if you want to others, or we can help you ourselves with the insights that we have and the resources that we have. Um, so if you're from SCORI, you can contact your RA and I put the email address right there, your regional assistant. If you're from Scopy, um, you can contact me because in, within Scopy, I am directly um, responsible for the global health part. Um, and I want to mention again, a very, very important resource is actually our guidebook. So check out your Neo Nori, Leo Lori, or your student folder and um, check out this guidebook because this guidebook actually has a lot of background information on the topic. And I think that is it from my part and I will um, hand it back to Tommaso. Yes, it is. Can you please go to the next slide while I'm checking the questions? So yes. Keep the slides on your screen. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so yes, as I was saying, we have um, we have now um, finished the online meeting and essentially we have a few minutes for you to ask questions on the topic. If you have any questions, just feel free to use the chats in the YouTube. Um, that's just a chat on the right of the screen where you can see the webinar. Um, so I have, we actually have a question from Sultan. Um, mm -hmm. have quite a long question, I think it might be I mean, it's quite related to, to Dr. Jessica Everts and uh, her um, presentation. So in that case, we will 
just forward the question to her and she will reply and then we will just share her reply um, through the main servers so the scopy and scopy servers for example um, but i can maybe i can read the question i think i can also try to answer that if you want to then integrate with something it is you, you can of course mm -hmm. do it as well uh, so the yeah. question is since we all want to be good physicians and learn as much as possible many people aim to go to african countries as they allow you to practice what you can't do in a developed country due to rules etc if no students attend such doesn't that affect future physicians as well as uh, it might decrease um, the amount of help to those countries can you explain what's the solution and once you apply for residency or specialty the hospital will pick someone with better skills and experience rather than someone who has better knowledge about global health so how do you fix this and convince students that they shouldn't do such stuff like the girl who wrote on instagram hashtag i don't know what i'm doing um i think from my side i think we should try to just change our mindset and promote a different vision of these kind of experiences as medical students so we shouldn't try we shouldn't have the idea that we are the solution to the problems of these countries um so we are not there to essentially save them or just save uh yeah the situation and and fix the problems of the healthcare system or of resources or um in, in any kind of country um so we should try in general i think it's also something that we uh, highlight as a point in our um, pre-departure training that has been shared yesterday, by the way, with in collaboration with UNESCO, um, which is avoiding idealizing your own country and also the um, avoiding uh, essentially idealizing also the host country. So we should just try to change our mindset and rather than focusing on us as individuals and people who are going there to just learn and because because doctors and hosting communities give us the task and think that we are um, that, that we are essentially uh, helpers they are there um, to to um, give them a really really big hand in uh, with a hospital or with a lab or whatever it is we should maybe demand more for um, a social change or work um, together with, as, as federation for example to um, demand for change um, in the in the politics and from a social perspective, um, and also as we are doing with the, as I can say. Um, so in general, I, I would say that we should try to solve the problems as global community of countries who have poorer health outcomes with uh, politics essentially. Um, so this is my my thing. Um, we are not, we're never going to solve the problems as individuals in general. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the risk at the same time, we have to mm -hmm. think that our main duty is to protect the patient. So um, we're not going to solve the problems. We might have, they might have a, one person more for a month helping them with the duties in the hospital. But at the same time, they might be, you, you might also harm the patients if you're not really trained for performing any type of procedure or type more complex procedures and so on. So this is a kind of thing that I would like to, to, to say as my personal opinion. I don't know if you, it is if you want to say something else. Yeah, yeah, I can quickly say something to this as well. I think it's a very good question because there is, there is a problem here, which is, of course, presented by Jessica as well. So it is very good to be aware of the fact that this is going through some people's minds and therefore also important to address. So first of all, I would really recommend you to check out the training that has been released today. Um, uh, the UNESCO uh, pre-departure training um, developed by the IT as well um, because it can really give you insight on these ethical issues and I just want to re-emphasize what Tomaso said because we are not the saviors there we are going on exchanges to learn and not to save a country or anything like that and the learning is what you do <clears throat> in an ethical manner so by observing not by not doing anything that is not within your capacity or within your legal capacity even um so it's very important to be aware of that and i completely agree with what tomasa said yep okay thank you iris um so are there any other questions guys we will wait for an additional minute because in the meantime we see that no one else added 
or send questions to the chat. Um, if not, we will say goodbye. And don't worry, Sultan, for <laughs> for the for the long question. It's fine. It's it's a moment for you to to have uh, to to ask. Ask and share your questions and doubts, whatever you want to share about the topic. So really, um, we really, really hope that you enjoyed this webinar. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really, really hope that now you feel more motivated and also you have some kind of concrete um, tips on how to implement Global Health in, exchange, in the exchange program uh, in your NMO, in your local committee. Um, so please um, just feel free to contact us for any type of questions and also any type of request uh, for help if you mm -hmm. need help in implementing Google Health. It is has already shared all the resources available and also the contact uh, in the emails uh, of the people who are responsible for implementing Google Health to supporting the NMOs and implementing Google Health into the exchange program. So that's it. Thank you very, very much. Um, and okay, I'm just gonna show a face for the last time. Mm -hmm. And yes, I guess, yeah, we're done. So thank you very, very much. Thank uh, you again. Have a great exchange this week. Yeah.